I'm Jane Hansen, and this week in the arena, we're taking a look at the role of the church in politics, the separation of church and state, obviously a significant part of our Constitution. Our country was created, after all, by people seeking many freedoms, including the right to worship their own God. But in a democracy like ours, the line is often blurred. And what is the church's obligation in the debate over laws that affect our moral conscience? Joining us now are Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and our special guests, Eric Ulrich, New York City Councilman from District 32 in Queens, and Paul Moses, Professor of Journalism at Brooklyn College and recent author of The Saint and the Sultan, The Crusades, Islam, and Francis of Assisi's Mission of Peace. He's also a former journalist, or always a journalist, working like at so. Newsday. Thank you guys for joining us. Let's Thank start you. with you, Monsignor. We have a new Congress. We have a new governor of the state of New York. We have a new legislature. What do you think are going to be the hot-button issues that the Catholic Church would like to have a say in? Well, I think the, the, the concern of any elected official today has got to be jobs, 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 and the economy. So I think that there's going to be a real focus on, on those issues. And, of course, that's a concern for the church. It's a concern for, for all people who live in the city. I think that that actually redounds to our benefit because a lot of the more aggressive liberal social agenda is going to kind of recede to the background. So that would be my guess, is that uh, there'll really, really be a focus on, on jobs and the economy, and some of the more radical elements of a social agenda will, will not be as in the forefront of things. So, but Councilman, what about you? I can't agree with him more. Um, be honest with you, a good quality of life starts with a job. We all know that. Health care and everything else comes after that. If you don't have a job, you don't have anything. And so uh, people aren't looking for handouts. They're looking for a paycheck. And I think that the focus of the new administration in Albany and certainly the focus at City Hall has been on trying to create good paying jobs that support middle class working men and women across the city and across the state. If we are not able to enact policies that encourage and stimulate the economy, then we're not doing our job. And if we don't do our job, the voters are going to find somebody else that will. And clearly they demonstrated that uh, just last year when they elected a new Congress and, and new governors and new senators all across the country because people really got sick and tired of the status quo and the stalemates that existed in various parts of the legislatures across the country and across the state. And people voted for change, but this time they voted for change that would actually benefit them. Well, uh, Paul, do you actually think that we will see that enormous kind of change, or is it going to be another deadlock kind of situation? It's, it's, it's hard to be optimistic about Albany, but, you know, I think the big issue up there is the budget um, that can impact on Catholic schools, which get certain funds from the state, impacts on social services, which are important to the Catholic, uh, Catholic Church and the Catholic outlook. So I, I, I think in that sense, um, from a Catholic perspective, I think there, there's a lot of things going on uh, in, in Albany. Um, I don't know if um, uh, bills to kind of expand um, rights to abortion will advance under the, in this legislature or not, but that was there last year also. So there, there are quite a few things. Well, we have a new governor who is Catholic, but has also been known to be pro such things as gay marriage. So again, now we're talking about the separation of church and state right at the, the highest executive level in Albany. How's that work out? You know, if we had, if we had gone with the litmus test of abortion and, and you know, marriage and so forth, we would have uh, Carl Palladino as our governor. And I, I think in some ways that shows that that litmus, litmus test works pretty poorly because I, 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 don't think I'll, I don't think I'm going to an extreme and saying that I don't think we'd be in good shape with Carl Palladino having to, to lead the, the state government at this point, uh, doesn't have the, didn't have the experience. Uh, so that, that's kind of my observation in response to, to mm -hmm. what you, you asked. Yeah, Councilman, what about you? I mean, as, as, a, as a young man who was born and raised in the Catholic faith, and, and there has to be many times when that separation of how you feel morally and how you grew up and what you believed in has to be challenged on a regular basis. Well, you know, that, that exists in every profession, in every walk of life, where people are having to choose between making decisions based upon what they think is right um, or based upon uh, what they think uh, they're expected to be like or decisions that other people might expect them to make. And you brought up an interesting point with respect to the separation between church and state. And that always comes up, ironically, when it, when it involves Catholic politicians. But God forbid we tell a, a Muslim public official or an Orthodox Jewish public official that he or she can't vote a particular way or can't do something. So what I will, is that? I, well, because I, I believe firmly, and that some people may disagree, that the last acceptable form of prejudice in this country is anti Catholicism. And, and it's not so blatantly. Uh, 
you know, put out there or so forwardly uh, put out there. But I will say that people do expect Catholic politicians to leave their values and leave their beliefs at the door when they walk in the halls of government, and that's certainly not true. Is the, is the church separate from the state? Absolutely. That's why priests aren't allowed to run for public office. However, the state cannot be separate from morality, and the church represents many values that are countercultural and consistent with the moral teachings that are normative across cultures and across the country. I, I think that it's important when we get into separation of church and state. First off, I can run for government. I can run for elected office as a priest. Uh, the state doesn't prevent me from doing that. I, my rights are intact as a uh, as an American citizen. I can vote. I can say what I want to do. The church limits me in terms of my involvement in an elected, uh, in elected government. So I think it's important that the church constrains, uh, and I constrain myself in terms of my so involvement. So the church is keeping an eagle eye on, on that kind no, of I think separation? That the, I of... think the church does not want to denigrate the pulpit. And so there is a concern that really my moral voice can be impacted by my involvement in elected politics. That being said, that being said my rights remain intact, and, and I'm, I have an obligation uh, to speak up against injustice and again, when the dignity of the human person is confronted or denigrated. So priests have responsibilities to engage in the political discourse because they have an obligation to educate their parishioners about how their religious values, their moral values, uh, ought to influence the way in which they live their life. In the same way that I would do that for someone who is running a company, that somehow my Catholic faith has to be brought to bear in terms of the decisions I make as an employer, as someone who is a, as, as a superior or manager of others, so too my Catholic faith has to be brought to bear in the, in the decisions I make, the political decisions I make. The question is, is what's really the appropriate level of engagement? As a priest, my role is really to help sanctify people in the sanctuary. Lay people, they're the ones who are called to transform the world. And I think a, a fellow young man like Eric, Eric had been in the seminary, left the high school seminary and went into elected officials. I mean, really, that's the appropriate role of a Catholic layperson is to be the leaven in the midst of our society. I have a question for you, though, Paul, because sure. Eric was talking about how feeling that Catholic legislators are far more persecuted in a certain way than others. Do you agree with that? You know, I used to be a religion writer at Newsday, so I covered all the religions. Every religion is convinced that they're the one that is the most discriminated against. And I think some of the others have a pretty strong case to make. But uh, there, is, there is a historical tradition in New York State of, of uh, anti-Catholicism because the Pope is going to come in and tell everyone in New York how to, how to live. That, that goes back to the 19th century. So, so, so I... It, it's there, but I don't think, I, I don't like to compare discrimination right, against right, right. Catholics. The Blaine, like, Amendment, yeah. the Blaine Amendment, which is in the New York State Constitution, was explicitly anti-Catholic yeah. in, its, in, its, in its formulation and explicitly anti-Catholic in terms of how it was passed in the legislature. And in, 19, in the late 1960s, there was attempts to repeal the Blaine Amendment. Those attempts failed also because of anti-Catholicism. So other religions have not endured the same sense of anti Catholicism institutionalized as, I, I, as what I, I would like to clarify what I said before. I mean, certainly, mm -hmm. I still believe, and, and I stand by my comments, that I believe that anti-Catholicism is the last acceptable form of prejudice among American political thought today. Uh, but aside from that, you know, it, it's not only prevalent in, in the history of New York State politics or New York State, but if you look at the 1960 presidential election, John mm -hmm. F. Kennedy, a president, how many people and how many states were reluctant, reluctant to support a U.S. Senator simply because uh, they thought that Little John was going to listen to Big John, what he thought, and how many political cartoons and how many articles mm -hmm. that were rehashed from t 30 years earlier when Al Smith ran for president, and then we saw it when, when you know, a, a different manifestation of that when, when John Kerry ran for president against George W. Bush in mm -hmm. 2004. Very interesting. Catholics are held to an unfair standard and they're expected to act and speak and do things a certain way when other legislators or members of government that are faithful to their religions are not. It doesn't, it's not so sensational. Yeah, but Eric, I think the question really is about policy. I mean, our great concern is, of course, Catholic hospitals being held to a standard where they would be required to perform abortions. I mean, we see already that one Catholic hospital was stripped of its Catholic identity because of, because of the performance of abortions. I think our concern is, is will we be required in Catholic institutions to perform gay marriages, or if we rent our space, so that our space be permitted uh, for use of people who are who are, who are performing gay marriages. But let's let's you know, get Paul? Our, our Catholic hospital system in New York City just went down the drain basically yeah. 
not because of those issues, but because of the politics involving Medicaid and other things. I, I think th that shows you where the Catholic Church's political influence in New York State is really at a low. And I just want to get back to this, to this concept, though, of, of having a governor who is Catholic, who has a woman who lives in the governor's mansion that is not married to him, and it's and there are you know even many strong staunch conservative Catholics have said I don't have a problem with that. I'm just wondering, his fa his father of course was was known for the abortion issue. From a journalistic standpoint, how hard is it to be a Catholic and be the governor of the state? It depends on how how his bishops are willing to to relate to him if if um, if they feel called to. Uh, to make a big issue of, of the things you've mentioned. I, I think that would make it difficult. Uh, if, if not, I, I don't think it will, it will become a big issue. All right. I, I think we have an obligation. I mean, here's the thing. The, f the fact is, is the governor is a public official, and I think that when he receives communion in a public fashion, there is an ob ob obligation, really, on the church to kind of, in, in a very subtle way, in a pastoral way, to kind of address these questions. Now, how it has been worked out in terms of his own conscience, I don't know. But my suspicion is is that the governor, who from, from all reports seems to be a serious Catholic, I'm sure that those issues are being worked through. My concern with the governor is really specifically on policy questions, uh, policy questions which will have far-reaching impact uh, for the Catholic Church. Paul and had for mentioned- all of the people who live here in the Diocese of Brooklyn, yeah. hold the rest of that thought because we're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a moment. Paul, we want to thank you so much for being with us. And we are, you're going to stick around, Eric. Um, we want to remind you that you can weigh in on our discussion anytime by going to our website at netny.net slash in the arena. Click on enter the arena. We welcome your questions and your comments. And we'll be right back. Welcome back as we continue our discussion on the role of the church in politics. Joining us for this segment once again is Eric Ulrich, New York City Councilman from District 32 in Queens, and now also John Heyer II, the Executive Director of the Catholic Citizens Committee. John, let's start with you. What is the Catholic Citizens Committee and what do you guys do? Well, the Catholic Citizens Committee is a 501c3 nonprofit whose purpose is to really boosts up voter registration, uh, primarily in Brooklyn and Queens among the Catholic population. Um, we've seen statistics and we know from data that Catholics do not um, vote. They do not vote. Uh, many of them aren't registered to vote. Uh, there's kind of been this uh, ideology amongst ourselves, this uh, lackadaisicalness, that you know, separation of church and state means that if you're vehemently um, opposed to things because of your religious beliefs, you just don't say it publicly. Um, and that, that isn't the way things should be, and that's what we're trying to get around. It, it's kind of hard to believe that in this city that people don't say what they mean and mean <laughs> what they say, because that's kind of what the New York reputation is. But I guess my question is, do you believe then that if, the, if you were able to find all of these Catholics register and get them to vote in some kind of a block, it could have a significant power, bit of power? I, I think there would be overwhelming power. I, I would just say, for instance, like, let's take a look at other groups, uh, whether they be union groups, the UFT, Teachers Union, who are able to do this. Um, let, let's look at other groups like, let's say, the LGBT community, um, who are vehemently uh, you know, fighting for uh, gay rights as well as same-sex marriage. They are obviously a small uh, major, uh, minority, rather, but at the same time, because they are organized, because they have a cause and they vote as a block, they are extremely powerful, all the way from our city's mayor to the governorship to you know, our federal officials, the president of the United States. And so I, I think that's something that we as Catholics need to think about is, should we be speaking up for the things that we really hold dear? I mean, just take, a, take for instance, Catholic education. About 35,000 kids in Catholic schools. Let's assume each of them have two parents. So that should be 70,000 voters, theoretically, people who would be proponents of Catholic education. If there were 70,000 voters making phone calls, walking the pavement, actually turning people out to vote on Election Day, uh, those parents, they, they would see a significant savings uh, in their children's education. And that savings is pretty substantial. When you take a look at a kid in Catholic uh, high school today, they're paying probably close to $12,000, I think. So that's not that's not chump change, and yet it seems that in, in some issues, like on education, Catholics kind of don't don't actually seek to be involved in agendas that will advance their own it's, needs. It's a very interesting point that John and Father Harrington bring up in the sense that uh, many Catholic leaders uh, expect Catholic politicians to espouse a strong Catholic identity when, in fact, our constituents do not. 
uh, and how difficult that is, that disconnect that does exist between uh, people's uh, religious beliefs in one sense and then also what their voting behaviors are. Certainly the church has always wanted to foster uh, a, a strong belief in, in getting involved in civics and getting involved in the community because of the church's belief in the common good mm -hmm. and so many other moral teachings of the church that have you know, go along the same lines as what, what the government yeah, is pursuing, got, good education. Well, I, I think now you have to, crossing that line, But though. you see, I think a guy, you got to take a look at a guy now that you have, an, you have an elected official here, a councilman, right? So let's, and there is a piece of legislation that's now on the, that is now being considered by, by the council with regard to abortion right. and, uh, and making sure that uh, places that are crisis pregnancy centers have to clearly identify that themselves as not performing abortions and going through a whole list of things, which the, the penalties are worse than for not displaying a no smoking sign in a uh, candy store. So, I mean, it's very much targeted towards crisis pregnancy centers, the majority of whom are run by Catholic institutions or people who are Catholic. Here's the problem. When, when Councilman uh, Ulrich votes against that piece of legislation, there are going to be a lot of groups in this city who are going to come in with a lot of money who are going to work to defeat him on election day. And the problem is, is that because his Catholic values uh, encourage him to vote against this legislation, the problem is on election day, it doesn't translate into Catholic voters coming out and supporting him or Catholic, Catholic citizens contributing to him, giving him money so that he can run an effective campaign or Catholic citizens coming out and working to make sure you have the petitions and, and the yeah, organization but, you need to, to stay in office. Isn't it true, though, that it's not just Catholics who voted you into office? So why is it that's that... Right. And, and that's a very good point that you bring up because when I vote at the city council, the first question I don't ask myself is, is what would Jesus do? I mean, I can't... Clearly, that's, that's not fair because I represent people who are not Christian and I represent interests that are not consistent with those beliefs. But... Um, that bill in particular, the, the bill that's going to target the crisis pregnancy centers, besides the fact that it is obviously, by coincidence, by virtue of the fact that most of the centers are run by the Sisters of Life, for right. instance, or other Catholic organizations, going to target those religious institutions, it's also violating the free speech rights of people who are pro-life and they may not necessarily be Catholic, people who obviously want to provide an alternative to women who are considering having an abortion. If you're, this is the great hypocrisy of the pro-choice movement, in my opinion, the pro-abortion, whatever you want to call it. When you imply that something is pro-choice, when you say something is pro-choice, it means you have the right to choose one thing or the other. You can't, mm -hmm. life over death, you can't say that you can only choose death or you can only choose abortion, that, that people don't have a right to choose life because when people open a different establishment and say we want to provide a foster, a fostering, nurturing environment for women who are in tough situations, mm -hmm. like my mother. My mother's 15 years old when she had me, so I don't want to hear about this, you know, back alley nonsense. Okay, there are people who get into tough situations and who are looking for help. They turn to their family, they turn to their priest, they ask themselves a difficult question: Am I prepared? Am I ready? Am I am I able to bring this life into the world? And then here's a place where I can get a different point of view. There are many women who walk into crisis pregnancy centers and walk out and still go have abortions anyway. Nobody is chaining them to the, to the tables or telling them that they have to give birth and they want them barefoot and pregnant. Okay, but but how, how, do you, how do you have somebody, how do you have an elected official? I mean, this would be the question for me, right? How can you have an elected official, say, stand up, oppose abortion rights, and then have now and NARAL and the Planned Parenthood against you? come out in favor of Catholic education and then have the UFT against you. And by the way, oppose uh, same-sex marriage. So, so support you, and you have the, and, and and what, you have the homosexual but, community uh, vigorously and opposing you. at the same time, you. the only other group then that would come out on the opposite side would be, let's say, the church as an institution, and they're not allowed to. And so that's why we as citizens, as, as Catholics, decided to form this Catholic Citizens Committee in order to try to be just one other voice on that opposite side. And, and I think it's important to note that you guys also are not just a C3 operation, you have also... Right, exactly. I was going to go into that further. We have a C3. We're also in a 501C4, which is a lobbying organization where we can lobby on just issue-based... Um, exactly. Yeah. As well as having a PAC. We have a federal, we have a state, and we have a city PAC, which allows us to endorse and help candidates, such and as Councilman Norwich. there's democracy, by the way, with the free exchange of ideas. The liberals and, and my colleagues, and I agree with them on many issues. I'm not targeting liberals. I'm just identifying them for the purpose of this. Say, you know, how dare you tell a woman what she can or cannot do with her body? This is not right. Okay, what's wrong with having different ideas exchanged, different that, expressions, that's what this whole different beliefs? Is based upon. That's but what correct. the sense that I'm getting here is that I think back to your basic question is, is it possible to be a really devout Catholic and live to all of the ideals of the church and still be 
an elected official. Absolutely. It's, look, a majority, other than the controversial issues, which everybody loves to talk about, gay marriage and abortion, 99% of Catholic teaching, particularly with respect to social justice, is consistent with what is taking place in New York State and so many other states. Adoption, health care, elderly, Medicaid, Medicare, immigration reform, all of the issues that the liberals, the, the media, and all these establishments you know, are passionate about, the church agrees with them on. But the church also takes exception to the fact that when you violate the basic rights that are inherent to each and every human person, the human dignity of the human being, just as if you were going to throw the old lady out of the bed in the nursing home, if you're going to try to chop up a baby in a womb at eight months or nine months, we have to stand up against that. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, I think the and issue is there's like a militant secularism yeah. that pervades particularly our New York City culture and also, uh, I think, the Northeast culture, which is sort of trying to displace people of faith and God from the conversation. And, and I think that that's a real challenge because if you take a look at the Declaration of Independence, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. You know, what is it? They are endowed by their creator. There is this presumption, right, that it's not simply we, a secular entity that is, that it arbitrarily comes up with rights, but somehow there is a higher power that has bestowed these rights upon us, that there's a certain dignity that we possess by virtue of the fact of, of who we are as men and women. I, and I think that that's really the challenge. I, I, I just for would want to interject that in, because I do agree with the councilman when talking about those issues, but I disagree with him at his basic premise because he has the, the, um, the, the privilege of serving a great constituency which does follow exactly what he's saying. I ran for office in a district which does believe in abortion vehemently and does believe in same-sex marriage vehemently. And because of those two issues, I was completely derailed and demonized even to the point where now after the election, I can't find a political job. I was actually already denied once a political job because I am actually... Because of your beliefs? Be, because I don't support same-sex marriage. And that's exactly the way it was put to me behind closed doors. And so, I mean, I do understand what the councilman is saying, but he happens to be within one constituency. Look, look at our governor, who is a Catholic, but, so, but, but at the top of his list of his top ten priorities during his campaigning was same-sex marriage. And the fact is, is that a person you know, who is running for office, and I'm sure the councilman will kind of attest to that, when people look at the numbers, the first thing they do is they take a look at the numbers and say, is it possible for me to win this district because of who I am? Does it fit with the demographics? Does it fit with the voter registration right. numbers? Right. So forth and so forth. I have, I have a you, large Catholic constituency, but I will say that I, have to be your I, last words, I also... <laughs> I also have a large Hindu, Indo-Caribbean uh, constituency, as large, a large Jewish constituency, and I have people who identify themselves as non-believers, and I would say that's consistent across the city. There are a majority of Catholics living in New York City, voting in New York City, working in New York City, uh, but unfortunately they don't always identify themselves as Catholics yeah. first and foremost. Right. Yeah, right. right, exactly. Well, listen, thank you all for participating in this, in this conversation. Thank John, you. Eric, we really appreciate it. And obviously you're going to stick around. And it's a conversation that will continue to go on, but it's also all about communication. Right. So thank you. We're going to take a final break. We want to again remind you that can be part of our discussion by going to our website at netny.net slash in the arena and click on enter the arena. When we come back, We'll be joined by our regular contributors and continue the conversation on the role of church in politics. Stay with us. Welcome back. Continuing our conversation on the issue of the role of the church in politics, we are joined once again by Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and our regular contributors, Elizabeth Scalia, Managing Editor of the Catholic Portal at Patheos.com and author of the blog, The Anchoress, and Grant Galicia, the Associate Editor of Commonwealth Magazine. Okay, guys, you've been listening to our discussion, and... New year, new Congress, new state legislature, new governor. What do you think is going to be the real hot button topics? Well, I think the Republicans have made clear that they're going to uh, attempt to repeal the health care reform law, which is uh, nothing more than political theater because it ain't going to happen. Um, this is about setting the goalposts for a future political reality when the, the GOP hopes they're in charge. 
about this is that basically they'll vote to repeal health care, which will fail because the Senate won't uh, the Senate won't repeal it. Right. But what they will do is they'll defund some of the provisions in the health care legislation, and and so that's where it's going to be kind of changed on the margins. And when we get to that separation of church and state in politics, you actually would be quite pleased if they were to reform or or marginalize some of those. I, I think, I, I mean, I think there are certain provisions which, uh, you know, Grant and I might disagree with, but there would be certain concerns about expansion of abortion uh, funding that we would, that I think that we would be happy to see some changes to the legislation, let's put it that way. But there are going to be some really tough things to pull back on, such as the provisions for seniors in the, in the health care bill. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about earlier um, with the councilman, and we, we were discussing this whole idea of being a good Catholic and being a legislator. And I'm just curious about your take on Governor Cuomo, for example. We've you know, heard a lot of different views on him. What, what do you think? I think when it comes to social justice issues, you'll see him line up quite easily with uh, the Catholic Church on a lot of them, you know, illegal immigration being, I think, a big one. Um, but I also think that Cuomo is a legacy of his father who introduced a lot of corkscrew logic for Catholic politicians that is still affecting us, and, and I think in a very negative way. Um, this whole idea that um, I don't personally approve of abortion, but it's not my place to, to dictate to anyone else is such nonsense. And Cuomo was the one who really introduced that and sold that, that meme to the public. You know, it, it doesn't really work if you then say, okay, Governor Cuomo, if you were personally opposed to slavery 150 years ago, would you say, but it's not my place? With Governor Cuomo, which is going to be very interesting, is a dynamic where the, he'll be uh, at odds with labor union and big labor. And, and I think that that's going to be the most interesting story. Grant? Uh, I think when it comes to same-sex marriage, uh, the politics are on the governor's side. Uh, it's not, I, don't, I think the church has yet to make a good public case how, why same-sex marriage would harm how, traditional how can, marriage. How can, how can you say that? How can you think that that to be the case when last year the Senate Democrats controlled that body, they, they lost that vote by eight, now the Republicans control that body. Why would you think that the, the same-sex marriage legislation would pass in this, uh, oh, in this I, environment? I, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that it, that it will, but I'm saying the, the, the general position that he takes so, what, when, what, when it comes to, to the, the wider public's view of, uh, of the okay, issue, I, but, I don't well, think he I mean, loses. Do you, think that, do you think that the governor, when you consider the unemployment rate in the state of New York, the impact, the real the economic catastrophe in the state of New York, that he's going to propose same-sex marriage First, legislation, no. which is no, probably no. going to fail at a time when people are out of work and unemployed. To do and so, sure, I think, would be suicide. At the top of their, yeah. Well, yeah now, he may do it. It would be suicide. And i got to tell you, he, you know, I don't know what he will do. The thing that's interesting to me about Cuomo in, in terms of this is this is a guy who has not had a real serious campaign last time around. You know, Carl Paladino was not a very strong opponent. Uh, he did not have a very strong opponent in the attorney general's race. So it's going to be very interesting to see a guy who has not had a vigorous campaign where mm -hmm. ideas were not really well vetted and, uh, and played out, how he holds now up as governor. Last words from you? We are nearing a, a time when it may not be possible to be a good Catholic and be an elected official. Elizabeth? What do you mean the church has not made explicit and clear um, a good argument, put forth a good argument against same-sex marriage? I'll tweet it to you. No. <laughs> I think we should and go we back to And we can tweet it to the people out here who are watching this because we are out of time. Elizabeth, thank you. Grant? Father, any last words? No, I, I think it'll be an interesting year. Looking forward to it. <laughs> As always. And thank you again for being with us. And remember that you don't need a TV to watch the net. We are always on online at netny.net. For all of us here, I'm Jane Hansen. We'll see you next time in the arena.